So we've certainly heard a lot of enthusiasm here from the stage. There's a lot of excitement around this technology. Um, this is stuff that could potentially save lives, uh, save endangered species, um, help us explore other planets. The uh, applications are like, right now, kind of limitless. We really don't know what the potential are. Um, but I think we have to ask ourselves, are we drinking some kind of unmanned Kool-Aid right now? Um, this next speaker is going to help us explore the uh, moral hazards of drones. Um, he's a professor at UMass Lowell. He's a philosopher and ethicist. Um, he has a couple of uh, op-eds published in the New York Times. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome Mr. John Kay. Before the um, before inviting, he said, "This is kind of like um, taking taking medicine." He says, "Give them give them a little bit of medicine." So here's their medicine. <laughs> so I'm a philosopher, which might lead you to believe that I'm in the wrong place, but I don't think that I'm in the wrong place because I think that philosophy needs to be a little bit more practical than it currently is, and I believe that the current discussion about drones needs to be just a wee bit more philosophical. So over the next two days, you should hear a lot about the Fourth Amendment. I've not heard about it very much yet, but you should hear about it, right? And the discussions about the potential illegalities associated with um, the next generation of drones when it comes to surveillance and security, these discussions are undoubtedly important. But I would actually think that we're sort of getting ahead of ourselves for the following reason. A discussion about the potential illegalities associated with, with, with the potential use of these uh, technologies needs to be prefaced by a broader discussion of the potential immoralities associated with these devices. So I'd like to take 14 minutes and 10 seconds to slow down to sort of rest ourselves from the technological mindset that we sort of give ourselves over to when we're confronted with these very, very impressive technologies. I think they're cool too, okay? But slow down. Take 13 minutes and 48 seconds to be decidedly human, to ask about human judgment behind drones. So we heard BJ said, say that he didn't like the idea that of a drone, because there's always a human in the loop. Well, we should sort of slow down and ask, what sort of um, what sort of normative judgments go into that human in the loop? And should we not take extra care to sort of um, hone our abilities when it comes to those types of judgments? So I'd say just slow down. But I'd also say that I'd like to talk about this concept known as um, a moral hazard. So a moral hazard, uh, for most philosophers, is a situation in which a party or an individual is willing to take on riskier behavior than otherwise, uh, than he or she otherwise would, because he or she does not have to face the costs associated with that particular action. Now, I've written about this in terms of the international use of drones, military drones, but I also think that this applies to surveillance. And when I hear about ag precision agriculture, no, I do not have these same concerns. But, but I actually think that we need to face the difficult questions, okay? And do it, enlist a philosopher. I'm not offering my expertise, but I'm saying uh, there are people who, who think about these issues. You may enlist, enlist lawyers. You already are. But I'm saying, okay, so this is what a moral hazard is. The history of the moral hazard is a sort of peculiar one. Um, in fact, it had nothing to do with uh, morality at first at all. It had everything to do with the insurance industry. The insurance industry discovered that when they insured the cargo of a particular company, that company was more liable to sort of take risky um, shipping practices. Similarly, when uh, you insure a driver, um, that driver it tends to um, drive a little less carefully. So what I would like to sort of deal with um, is the benefits that drones give us is a sort of double-edged sword. And I want to make sure that um, the freedoms that we have associated with the coming age of drones 
Um, don't allow us to sort of numb our moral judgment. Okay? Now, let's just let's just cut to the chase. When it comes to surveillance and security, if I understand it correctly, the drone industry is interested in making drone uh, surveillance drones cheaper, easier, more clandestine, which is to say, to make them ubiquitous. Now, I'm not an alarmist, I'm just, I think that this is what the drone industry is after when it comes to surveillance. The swarm is coming, I think someone said, right? So, let's just talk very briefly about some of the, one second, sorry, excuse me. Yeah, in the back, yeah, next to Gustavo. In the back? And seriously, in the back. Could you put your phone down and stop texting? It's a little rude. <laughs> so what are we concerned? Like, what's the public concerned about when it comes to drones? It's this. And I think we need to face it head on, right? And so <laughs> know your enemy, okay? So face it head on. This is what we're worried about. So. Between the time that you left your hotel room and ended up in that seat, you knew that you were being recorded. That was obvious, right? Being in public these days means being recorded. CCTVs are everywhere, and we know that. What we are worried about is that drones expand what is a public space in a particular way and reframe what reasonable search and seizure is. That's what the public is worried about. Now. This, this is what uh, most people call the age of persistent surveillance. And we don't mind it unless you're Carol in the back, right? Right next to Gustavo or right behind Gustavo. She's back there. Go on. Yeah. So, persistent surveillance is very, very convenient in certain respects. Sometimes Carol likes to think about the world as her own mini mart that has 24 hour. Uh, Close circuit TVs, right? She loses her wallet sometimes, it's very convenient. But sometimes Carol would like to step out of the mini mart, would like to go for a walk and not be watched. Okay? Like that. She would like to not be watched, right, Carol? Now, this brings us very quickly to what Jeremy Bentham calls the Panopticon. In the 18th century, Jeremy Bentham, British philosopher, came up with a very ingenious way of reforming the prison system. Within the Panopticon, prisoners could be watched from the central guard post at any time. The could here is really important. It's not that they were being watched at any time, but rather that they could be being watched at any time. Okay. Now, Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon is efficient. Why? Because the prisoners take up the responsibility of policing themselves, okay? If we think about this, when I called Carol out, most of you turned around. Look, look, first you looked, and then the next move that you made, check your cell phone, right? This should creep you out, okay? It creeps out the general public, okay? If it doesn't creep you, it creep you out, it creeps out the general public. And you, marketing drones or uh, programming de drones or deploying drones, you need to be aware that this is the worry, I think. So, Michel Foucault in the 20th century takes Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon and applies it to any disciplinary society, okay? Foucault maintains that disciplinary societies come into being with such technological precision, with such exactitude, that their advent, them coming into being, seems both necessary and inevitable. And I think, this is a real culture base. <laughs> I think, sorry. This is a real culture way I know. But as the public becomes more accountable because of these drone technologies, there needs to be a correlated call to conscience 
on the part of both the drone industry, but also the operators involved in their deployment. Okay. So, for the, for long into the long into the future, drones will not be drones. There will always be a human being in the loop, and this is an important point that should not be pushed into the background too far, both for marketing purposes, but also for just general philosophical ethical well-being. Okay. So how are we supposed to keep this uh, on our radars? We're, I'm gonna ask you to do a little experiment, okay? I'm serious. Next to you are living human beings, okay? Now this is gonna be the most uncomfortable part of your day, I'm sure, okay? But I'm, I'm very serious about it. I'd like you to, you know, not play along with me, but do something, okay? This is the, this is the professor in me. I would like you to look at somebody in the eyes for five seconds. Yeah, that's right. It's uncomfortable. Okay? But hold on, wait, wait, wait. We're gonna count it off. Wait, wait. See, see, laughter is a sign of nervousness. I know this. Like, I get it. It's deeply uncomfortable, but folks, I promise you that this is actually what the public wants the drone industry to realize. I I mean, let's be reasonable about this. So what I'd like you to do is pick a partner, find a partner, okay? And I would like you to look him or her in the eyes for just five seconds. Go ahead, find a partner, do it. <laughs> Got it? And I'm serious. You <laughs> too. I count, you see, this is it. This is accountability right here. You too, okay? I love this. Oh, hey, hey, big partner. <laughs> Big partner, let's do it. Here, I'm going to count off. Ready? Hey! This is my 15 minutes. I want you to look at somebody in the eyes for five seconds. I'm not asking much, okay? So just five. Here we go. One. Two. Three. Four, five. Whoa. <laughs> it's like, whoa. That's the, that's the strangest thing I've done all day. Folks, you feel that little quiver in your stomach. Yeah? Everybody feel it. It's stop on the back. Can you feel it? Yeah? Did you hear it? Yeah? Feel it. That's a sign. It's called the sign of being human. Drones don't feel that. They shouldn't. Okay? And that's what we need to remind ourselves in this drone age. Make the public feel that you realize that, that little quiver, okay? And your jobs are going to be much, much easier, okay? The quiver. The quiver is the sign of being seen and of watching. We watch. Drones don't watch. We are accountable. Drones aren't accountable. We are responsible. Drones are not responsible, okay? And that's what needs to be restated repeatedly, for your own sakes, okay? But also for mine. Now, th this is the case today and in any brave new world that we might create with drones, okay? So take your medicine and let's go to lunch. Okay, thanks. <laughs>